Well, good morning. How's everybody this morning? We good? Awesome. It's good to see you guys. Can you please stand to your feet with us? We're going to open up in prayer and we'll begin our service with a time of worship and, and to give God what is due to him. And that's our song, our praise, our full heart, our full attention this morning. So let's pray. Lord, we do come before you in Jesus name. Lord, we thank you, God, for this glorious day, Lord. Father, the day that you have made a day, Lord, that you knew would be here before time even began, Lord, that we would be here as a church, as a body gathered outside, Lord, to hear from you. So, God, we pray that we would receive all that you have for us this morning. Lord, help us to put aside any distractions, Lord, anything, God, that would just put our minds in a place, Lord, that that, Lord, anywhere but here. And so, God, we thank you. We love you for your son, Jesus, Lord, and all that he's done. And we pray, Lord, that today, today would be a day of salvation for many, Lord. So we love you. We thank you, God. And we just come now to worship you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> no greater love than Jesus. There's no greater love than He gives. There's no greater love than frees us. It's all deep within. Sing it again. There's no greater love than Jesus. There's no greater love than No greater love than frees us so deep within. All the world's empty pleasures, it's you pass away. But his love will last forever, my heart it shall remain. Greater joy. There's no greater joy than Jesus. There's no greater joy than He gives. There's no greater joy than frees us. So deep within. Sing that again. No greater joy. There's no greater joy than Jesus. There's no greater joy than gives there's no greater joy that frees us so deep within all the world's empty measures pass away but his love will last forever my heart it shall remain Greater peace. There's no greater peace than Jesus. There's no greater peace than He gives. There's no greater peace than Jesus. So deep within. Sing, we praise Your name. greater love 
There's no greater love than Jesus. There's no greater love than He gives. There's no greater love than Jesus. Song deep within. So now one more time. There's no greater love than Jesus. There's no greater love than He gives. There's no greater love than Jesus. So deep within. Amen. You may be seated. Every morning. so good, isn't he? 
it's amazing to think what his mercy's done for our lives and, and not just our life but for our eternity that's that's amazing love right there what he did for us would you guys please stand with us What will it be like when my pain is gone and all the worries of this world just fade away? What will it be like when you call my name in that moment when I see you face to face? Need my whole life to hear you say, Well done, well done, good and faithful one. Welcome to the place where you belong. Well done, well done, my beloved child. You have run. And now you're home Welcome to the place where you belong What will it be like When tears are washed away And broken What will it be like when I come into your glory Standing in the presence of the love so beautiful Waited my whole life for that day I will live my life to hear you say Well done, well done Welcome to the place where you belong Well done, well done My beloved child You have run the race and now you're home You're welcome to the place where you belong What will it be like when I hear that sound All of heaven's angels cry out Singing holy 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 are you Lord Singing holy Singing holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Waited my whole life for that day. Until then, I live to hear you say, Well done. Well done, good and faithful one. Welcome to the place where you belong. Well done, well done, my beloved child. You have run the race and now you're home. Welcome to the place where you belong What will it be like When you call my name In that moment when I see you face to face 
Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning that we are able to gather here, God. And Lord, we pray that, Lord, our hearts would be open, our ears would be open, our minds would be open to hear and to be honest with ourselves. Because if we claim to be thinkers, then we would, we should and must come to the conclusion that Christ is God, that he's Lord. If we're honest thinkers, the evidence is there. There's more evidence to believe in Christ than there is many other things in this world, and yet we seem to demand so much more to believe in Christ. Father, we pray that your spirit would take over that you'd speak to each person here this morning, as well as those that might be watching as we stream our Sunday service. We pray for those that don't know you, Lord. We pray for those who may enjoy being here and hearing the word and the beautiful music and the worship, God. But it takes a personal living relationship with you, God to be saved, to enter the kingdom of God. Lord, may you bind the enemy from this place, any interruptions, anything that would break in the flow of the Spirit, God. Protect each one here. We thank you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How you guys doing? All right, well, give your neighbor. There you go. All those out in the... East 40. Awesome. Glad to see all of you. Go ahead and you can have a seat. <clears throat> really great to see all of you here this morning. and We want to welcome each and every one of you. And if you're here for the first time, we're really blessed to have you. Because we know that God could have led you anywhere else today. But he brought you here. For a special reason. So hear what the Spirit has to say. And be open to what he has to say. This morning I'd like you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 1 through, 1 through 16. In our last three weeks, last three Sundays, we studied first the old man and his old way of life. That is the old nature, the fallen nature, and his old way of life. Then we looked at the new man. The new man is the new man in Christ, the born-again man. And then the man's new life after coming to Christ. And then last Sunday, we looked at not grieving the Holy Spirit. And Paul listed a bunch of sins, like corrupt words and anger, bitterness and a bunch of things that we take for granted in our life but they're sinful they break the heart of God and after learning all those things Paul now says here in the beginning of chapter 5 notice what he says therefore the therefore being in light of what I've already said with all this information he says I've given you now be imitators of God now be notice imitators of God as dear children of God. And you see, the only way you can imitate God is to be a child of God. And Paul now calls for the Ephesians to live like Christians. And a lot of times I have to emphasize biblical Christians. Because the name Christian is many times just a name. I grew up in a Christian home. My parents are Christian. Uh, you know, I, I've, you know I, I've been around Christians and I know some Bible and um, that doesn't make you a Christian. An intimate, ongoing, personal relationship with Jesus Christ till the day you die is a biblical Christian living by the word of God. To live life that matches your new nature. Paul said, be imitators of God in everything that you do. Why? You're children of God. 
In verses 1 and 2, again, therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and notice, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Paul says the believer's walk is important to him. He said our walk is to be a worthy walk. He said our walk is to be a different walk. He said we're to walk in light. We're to walk in wisdom. And he exhorts the believers to walk in such a way that their daily life is known by their love. And like I said, he starts off the very first verse with, therefore, taking us back to the last part of chapter 4, especially verses 31 through 32, walking in love. He said, that ties in with verse 31 and 32, where he said, well, you know, walking in love is like you know, kindness and tenderheartedness and forgiveness. Those are attitudes of God who is love. And God is definitely kind-hearted and forgiving. And the only way that we can have those attributes is by imitating the source of those attributes. The whole Christian life is mimicking God. We get our word mimic from the Greek word for imitator. A mimic is somebody who imitates, copies certain traits of another person. And because we are imitators of God, Christians are to mimic God's traits. And more than anything else, His love. The whole Christian life is mimicking the life of Christ. God's purpose in salvation is to save men from sin and to conform them into the image of Christ. And in order to do that, you have to know what God is like. And in order to know what God is like, you have to study his word. Because the Bible, his word, tells us all about himself. It reveals to us who God is. But the more we learn about God's character, the more we can learn, or the more we learn, how we don't even come close to it. And how possible it is for us to fulfill the command to be like him which is to be absolutely perfect like he is. Now, that is not something we can do. Not in our own strength. You see, it's natural for children, and in many of you who are parents, you have seen this. It's natural for children to imitate their parents. They copy what you do, whether it's good or bad. And it's only natural for children to imitate their parents because our Heavenly Father is holy, we're to be holy. And because He's kind, we're to be kind. And because He's forgiving, we're to be forgiving. Because God in Christ humbled Himself, we're to humble ourselves. And because God is love, we are to walk in love. It's not easy. Because it's not a natural thing for us to walk in love. That's why we need a new nature. That's why we need the never-ending power of the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of God working in us as we obey God's Word. The greatest proof of love is undeserved and unlimited forgiveness. The, day, the greatest display of God's love was when he gave his only son to die for our sins on the cross. And God's love brought forgiveness to man. To all men who wanted to receive that forgiveness. You see, you have to receive it. And because forgiveness is the greatest proof of God's love, it will also be the surest proof of our love. Love will always lead us to forgive others just like God forgave us in Christ. There's no better way to prove that you have a hard, loveless heart than to be unforgiving. Forgiveness always proves that love is present because only love has the reason and the power to forgive. How much love we have is based on how much we forgive. 
And you can see that in the cross. Christ suffered so much on that cross, and yet he was doing it to show us how much he loved us, how much he still loves us. You see, it doesn't matter what another believer may do to us, no matter how terrible or unfair or hurtful. Jesus paid the debt for that sin. And there was nobody on earth that was ever or ever will be treated as terrible or hurtful or unfair as Jesus was. No matter how others may disappoint, slander, persecute, or harm us in any way, his sacrifice was enough to pay their penalty. And when you want revenge, you're sinning. And you're letting selfish hatred control you, and you sin by disrespecting Christ's sacrifice for sin that he's already paid for. Jesus paid the penalty for every single sin, past, present, and future, if we confess it. That's why we don't have the right to hold any sin against anyone, not even against an unbeliever. How deep, <clears throat> how deep is your love for God? God has shown you how deep his love is for you by showing you how much he's forgiven you. The depth of our love is shown by how much you forgive others. How you love is also shown by how much you know that you've been forgiven. You see, he forgives in love because his heavenly father has forgiven in love. And he wants to be an imitator of his father. Our example for Christian living is Jesus Christ. Now, when I speak of love, especially biblical love, the love of God, it's not some feel-good, syrupy emotion or feeling for somebody. It is a sacrificial giving of yourself for their good. A sacrificial, sacrificial giving. No strings attached. If you're a Christian, you are commanded to love the way that God loves. Jesus said this in John 13, 34 and 35. He says, a new commandment I give you. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to his children. The children of God. A new commandment I give you. He says that you love one another as I have loved you. And that you also love one another. Now you might say, wait, wait a minute now. If I love somebody because I'm told to, I'm being a hypocrite. No, you're being obedient. Big difference. You're a hypocrite if you say, if you're smiling, oh, I've just, I just love it and I just feel so wonderful. And No. You're being obedient. How about your kids? When you tell them to do something. Most of the time they don't enjoy doing it but hopefully they're doing it out of obedience. Because we're in Christ, it's now our nature to love just like it's God's nature to love. I mean, God can't help it. He, it that's who he is. Because his nature is now our nature. For a Christian not to love is to live against his own nature as well as against God's nature. It's sin and willful disobedience of God's command, and it's ignoring his example. The Christian's walk is to love, to walk, the Christian's walk in love is to love every person, believer and unbeliever. Again, no strings attached. It's not because they're nice to me or good to me or polite to me. It has nothing. Biblical love, the love of God has nothing to do with the other person's behavior. Nothing. I do it because God has asked me to. And I do it in obedience to him. When Jesus died for us, it was an offering. He was an offering. A sacrifice to God. 
and it's called here a sweet smelling aroma. Now when the children of Israel used to come to the altar and they'd bring their animal sacrifices and they were doing it again for God and, and be, for their sins, the aroma of that sacrifice, you know, it, it would go up to heaven, you know, symbolically. And God would smell this sweet smelling aroma of his children making this offering to them. Well, that's what Jesus was to, to God when, when he died. He was a sweet-smelling aroma, a sacrifice to God. Because that sacrifice showed in the best way God's kind of love. Sa love is sacrificing. It's sacrificing. And Jesus himself said, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. <clears throat> Look at verses 3 and 4 now. He says, But... Fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. These are common sins of unbelievers today. But Christians should never, never, never be involved in sexual sins of any kind. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel, his own body, in sanctification, which means set apart. How, know, how each one should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and set, and set apart, and honor not the passion of lust, like the Gentiles, that is those who don't know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in, his ma in this matter. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has given us the Holy Spirit. God says we are to possess these bodies that now belong to him, this body who he now dwells in, it's become the temple of God. It's not to be involved in any sexual immorality, nothing, no sexual activity outside of marriage. None whatsoever. And he says Christians should never be guilty of filthiness and foolish talk or coarse jesting, he said. The word filthiness here is obscenity in general. It's any talk that's disgrading and disgraceful, meaning dirty speech. Instead of being involved in any kind of <clears throat> sexual sin or filthy talking, the believer's mouth should be busy, it says here, notice, thanking and praising God. If we're known for anything, it should be for loving God and others by continual thankfulness. Now, Paul says something very interesting he says in everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ in everything there are things that happen to us that you think well how can I thank God for this here's here's that thought it's not thanking God for something tragic that's happened to me but it's thanking him for knowing that, you know what, Lord, I could, it, it could be a worse situation for me. And thanking you, Lord, for teaching me something from it. We can always find reason to thank God if we look hard enough. But we always look at the bad things and, and usually get mad at God. Walk out on God. It's a tough thing to do, to be thankful in everything. But notice, Paul said, it's the will of God for us. It's a divine command. I mean, it's easy to thank the Lord for, for some things, but everything? And Paul warns us that filthy language does not belong in the believer's mouth because it doesn't reflect God's holy presence in us. How can we praise God and tell others about his goodness with one breath, and then the next breath, we're cussing. 
We're using foul language. God told Joshua, don't let the law of God depart from your mouth. In other words, in other words the word of God should always be pouring forth from our mouth. Listen to what James says in chapter 3, verses 9 through 12. Now, this is about the tongue. James wrote a whole chapter on the tongue by itself. And I'm reading it from the New Living Translation. He says, sometimes it, speaking of the tongue, sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh and water and bitter water? In other words, does a fresh running spring give you fresh water one minute and the next thing you go to get a drink and now it's salt water, bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No. He says, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. So therefore, a, a godly person cannot be praising God one minute and then cursing or talking filthy the next. Verses 5 and 7. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetousness, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of this, the things that these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. God does not play around when it comes to sin. And when you want to see how serious God is about sin, again, look at the cross. Jesus died a terrible, painful death for all sins, the sins of all mankind. That was serious business. Sin will be punished. And sin has no place in his kingdom nor in his family. These people described here by the sins that Paul condemns in verses 3 and 4, it says, notice again, they have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. They have no place in heaven. No person who practices a life of immorality, impurity, and greed can be a part of God's family. There will be no sin in heaven. Because this kind of a person cannot belong to God. Every person who's saved, that is every person who's born again, who's given their life to Christ, is instructed by the Holy Spirit and led by his new nature to give up sin and to follow after righteousness. The person whose everyday life pattern does not show that the Holy Spirit is leading their life can't say that God is his father or that the kingdom of Christ and God is their inheritance. Paul said in Romans 8, 14, For as many, notice, as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Notice, notice the, the, the separation. Those that are led by the Spirit of God, he says, these are the sons of God. Romans 8, 14. And then Romans 8, 9, and 10, he says, Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. You see, the only, time, the only way you receive the Spirit of Christ is when you receive him. And then he comes into your life. And you become a child of God. But Paul said, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're not his child. You're not his son. You're not his daughter. And without the Spirit of God, you can't live the life of Christ. You can't be an imitator of Christ. Because you can't do these things in your own power. Paul, warn, Paul warns the people, don't let anybody deceive you with empty words. Don't let anybody tell you that sin is tolerable, that it's okay, that God is not really that serious about sin. And that God won't exclude repent, unrepentant sinners from his kingdom. The devil would love for you to believe that. Listen to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Paul said in this passage, Do you not know that the unrighteous notice, will not inherit the kingdom of God? It's very clear. That's why he says, don't be deceived. He says, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, 
nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor, extor nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And he said, such were some of you. He was saying, you, some of you folks used to be these things. You used to live this life. But notice he says, you were washed, you were sanctified, that is set apart, you were justified. In other words, you were forgiven as if it never had happened in your life in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. So notice some of those sins that these people used to live. They live it no more. But now they've been set free from, 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 from some of those sinful lifestyles. He says, you were some of the, you, such were some of the, you used to be these things, but you're not anymore. And the point is, wrong living will keep you out of the kingdom of God. It's because of the sins listed here and the lies of empty words that the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. These people here are called sons of disobedience because of the unrighteous lives they live. Because it's their nature to disobey. And they're the children of wrath. In other words, they're inviting God's judgment upon them if they don't come to Christ someday. We're not even to take part in these sins with these people. Don't join the world in its sin, Paul says. Don't be partners with them in their sin. Be partners with Jesus Christ in righteousness. Don't mimic the world. Mimic God like dearly loved children, Paul said in verse 1. Verses 8 through 10. He says, for you were once darkness, but you are light in the world. But now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is, a, what, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Now here Paul compares what every believer's life was like before they were saved. With what God intends it to be like after they were saved. So Paul is comparing what every believer's life was like before they were saved with what God intends their life to be like after they're saved. A person who's been delivered from sin should have no more to do with sin. And they should live like they're saved and, they sh and, and, and cleansed like a child of God. Paul uses the biblical figures here of darkness and light to make his point. Paul said in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, we used to be dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Notice, you once walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, who is, who is Satan. Of the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Among whom also we all once, notice, we all once conducted our lives in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath just like others. But we're children of God now. He says we're not to be like that. We're not to live that way anymore. Now that we're born again, our dark lives are history. We don't live in darkness and blindness anymore. We were darkness before we came to Christ. We had no light. We were children of darkness and sons of disobedience. But what we are now, we are light in the Lord. Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 9, God called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And he's moved us now into his kingdom, his son's kingdom. And because we're now partakers of Christ's divine nature, we share in his light. Because Jesus, as he said, is the light of the world. We are now to be reflectors of his light. We're also to be the light of the world, but he's the source of that light. We need to plug into that source of light so that we can reflect his light to those around us. Because we're in the Lord. We who were once children of darkness are now children of light, and that's how we should walk. Now here in verses 9 and 10, Paul gives the characteristics of the children of light, which are called the fruit of the Spirit. 
Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But better Greek manuscripts have the word fruit of the, fruit of the light rather than fruit of the Spirit. We're fruit of the light. And there are three big differences or, or, or fruit of being children of light. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. Signs of true faith, signs of a true relationship, living relationship, saving relationship with Jesus is goodness, righteousness, and truth in our life. And, see, and you can't do these things on your own. You can't do these things in the flesh. That's why people, you know, in life when, when you know, they decide, you know, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to change the way I live. I'm going to be better. I'm going to do better. It doesn't last and you hear, oh, I tried that, I couldn't do it. I, you know, I, I, did, I wanted to quit this, I wanted to quit that habit, I wanted to change this, and, and, and they couldn't do it. Because you can't do it in, in, in the natural flesh. The word all. In verse 7 through 10, the word all reflects the perfection of God's standard. In other words, all goodness, he said, all goodness, that means that, which, that means that which is basically right. All goodness means that which is free from defects, that which is beautiful and honorable. All goodness refers to what's pleasant, useful, suitable, or worthy. All righteousness first deals with our relationship to God, but righteousness also has to do with how we love. Those who are made righteous in Christ are commanded to live righteously. And you know, when God gives a command, that means you can do it. The ability to do what he commands is built into the command. God will never command you to do something you can't do. You have, he's given you the ability to do it. It's just like any good parent, you will not command your child or order them to do something they can't do. You may command them to do it or ask them to do it, but you know what? I'll help you. I'll help you to do it. God's commands are his enablement. You can do it. All truth has to do with honesty, dependability, trustworthiness, integrity, in contrast to being a hypocrite, deceiving and living in the false ways of the old life, the old nature, the old ways of darkness. The word goodness here refers mostly to our relationship with other people. And the word righteousness mostly deals with our relationship to God. And truth deals mostly with personal integrity. Without bearing fruit, without bearing this fruit that Paul is talking about here, you know, goodness, righteousness, and truth. Without bearing this fruit, you have no evidence of God's life in you. Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits. It's like going up to an apple tree and you're expecting to get apples and, well, wait, there's, there's oranges, there's, there's figs. You know, you, a tree is known by its fruit. You can call it whatever you want, but the tree, the fruit that it bears proves it out. Every person bears some kind of fruit. Those who are in darkness, who are of the old nature, they're going to bear bad fruit. The sins that were listed here by Paul. Those who are, who are in the light, they are going to bear good fruit. Truth, righteousness, goodness forgiveness, love. There's no such thing as a fruitless Christian. Where there's life, there's proof of life. The child of light produces the fruit of the light. Produces the fruit of the light. What's a sign of healthy life? Growth. When you have a child, you watch that child grow. They get bigger, they put on more weight, they begin to learn, they become more stable, and they're, you know, when they start to stand and to walk and, and more coordinated with their hands. 
But if they're not growing and they're not putting on weight and not, they're not learning, you go, something's wrong here. There's something that's not healthy in my child's life. They're not growing the way that they should. The Christian life is the only healthy, is, is only healthy when it's growing. The Christian life is only healthy when it's growing. And your main concern in your walk as a believer should be continually trying to learn what pleases the Lord. And as you obey what you learn, then your knowledge of the Lord and His will increases and grows deeper. As you're faithful to the light that God gives you, He gives you more of His light. And as Christians learn and, and, and his, as Christians learn and grow in goodness and righteousness and truth, the way you live will prove that you are who you say you are. I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. The child of God will resemble his heavenly Father. And you know what? Don't rely on past experiences. Don't depend upon those things to think that you're saved. Oh, yeah, I cried when I heard the worship songs. Oh, they were so beautiful and they touched me. Oh, I liked the sermon, man. It made, me, it made me feel really good. Oh, I feel so at peace when I'm at church. Oh, yeah, I'm a member of a church. None of those things matter when it comes to the kingdom of God. That will not get you into the kingdom of God. Jesus said, you must be born again. Doesn't matter how exciting or meaningful your experience was at the moment. When you got the goosebumps with the song or the tears or you, all of this stuff. It can only be based for sure on the evidence of fruit being produced by a spiritual life right now that continues to grow. Verse 11 and 12. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. The child of light shouldn't be or even become involved in evil by association. The only way that we can be a witness to the world is to go into the world. And you'll see that it won't be long before we come in contact with all kinds of wickedness. I mean, you can see that right now. But we're never to be a part of that wickedness or give that wickedness a chance to take hold in our life. If we compromise God's standards, our witness is blown. Our character is weakened. And no act of unrighteousness is acceptable. We're not even to have contact with a fellow believer who's openly sinning. Paul's command is simple and it's to the point. Christians who are to produce the righteous fruit of light, are to have nothing at all to do with the unfruitful works of, of darkness. The Christian's responsibility is more than not taking part in the sins of the world. He's even to expose them. And if we ignore it, we encourage that evil. And we help promote it. We need to expose evil to those people around us. The word expose can also mean reproof, correction, punishment, or discipline. We are to confront sin with intolerance. Not with anger and, 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 and militancy or, or, you know, that's not what it's talking about. Intolerance means we don't accept it. We will tell somebody with love and grace. That's wrong. Paul said, speak the truth, but do it in love. But when you do, you can expect criticism. You can be accused of legalism. Ah, oh, you believe the Bible so literally. Oh, you believe that it's really going to happen? You bet I do. You'll be accused of lacking grace and lacking love. Oh, where's the love, brother? A.W. Tozer said this, and I love this, this, this quote. 
A.W. Tozer said, the man who preaches truth and teaches it to the lives of his hearers will feel the nails and the thorns. He will lead a hard life, but a glorious one. And that can, that, that can apply to all of you here. Not just one who preaches from the pulpit. But you preach the truth. And you apply it to those that are, you're talking to. You'll feel the nails and the thorns. And you'll lead a hard life. But it's a glorious one. Because you're right. And you're speaking God's truth. And then Paul goes on to say that's e that it's even shameful to talk about those things that are done in secret. Because some things are so wicked that we shouldn't even talk about them because even describing them is even morally and spiritually dangerous. Our resource for exposing evil is the Bible, which is light. The Bible will tell you all you need to know about evil. Some people, oh, well, I hang around with so-and-so so that I can you know, learn of why they do this and I can witness to them. Or I, I go to this place. I know I shouldn't be there, but I'm going to find out so I can learn how. No, I remember Pastor Chuck taught us one. He says, you don't have to stick your head in a trash can to know that it stinks. I love that. The Bible tells you what's evil. We listed a bunch of things right here. I don't have to find out. I don't have to learn. Bible teaches me what's evil. Our resource for exposing evil is for God's word, which is light. Verses 13 and 14, as we come to, uh, get, getting close to finishing here. Verse 13 and 14. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he, sa uh, he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Here Paul invites those who aren't children of light, those who aren't born again, those who have never received Christ, he's inviting them to come to the light and to be saved. Verse 15. He says, See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. He, the Bible says that a, that, a, that a fool is a person who says in his heart there is no God and who is morally corrupt and they do evil and vile things. The fool is a person who lives apart from God, denying God by the way that they live and by what they say. And in doing these things, he becomes his own God and he turns his nose up at God. And he turns his nose up at sin. And he's a fool because he pollutes everybody else with the ungodly foolishness that condemns him. Verse 15 and 16. As we close. See, uh, 15 and 16. Then, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Notice, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Paul's command here for believers to walk circumspectly. The word circumspectly means walk carefully. You're, you're, you're walking in the enemy territory in this world. This is the enemy's territory. This is not our home. We're pilgrims. We're walking through it. So walk carefully. It's like soldiers in, in battle. When they walk in through, they know enemy territory. They know that they can be mined. And they have to walk carefully through those minefields. To walk circumspectly, that is walk carefully, is based on what exactly Paul was teaching here. Circumspectly means accurate, it means exact, and it carries the idea of looking and examining and investigating something very carefully. It also carries the idea of alertness. The phrase redeeming the time is the idea of using our time wisely and using our opportunity wisely. Because we are living in evil days. Evil days gives us, gives us less opportunity for doing right. I'm sorry, I, say, I should say, I'm sorry. Evil days give us less, uh, they do give us less opportunity for doing right because they're evil. Evil distracts and it disrupts, disrupts us. With all the evil today, we have to be more responsible to use our time wisely. And then again, Paul says, therefore, 
in light of everything that he said in verses 1 through 16, he says, therefore, notice, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He takes us back now to the call for believers to walk as those who have been raised from the dead and they are now living in the light of Christ. Christians are to walk wisely, not foolishly, because they're God's children and they're saved through Christ's sacrifice. And only the wise walk wisely. Only the wise walk is fitting for the child of God. Paul commands believers to walk like wise men. In wisdom. To live like people they are, the people, the people that they are. In Christ we are one. We're separated. We are love. We are light. And we are wise. And what we do should match what we are and what we say. The words redeeming the time here means making the most of it. Redeeming the time, the word redeem has the basic meaning of buying. Especially buying back. That's what it means when we're redeemed. When, when we say we're redeemed by God, we've been bought back. Through the price Jesus paid upon the cross. He paid, he paid for us with his blood. He redeemed us. He bought us back from this world and the slavery of sin through his blood sacrifice upon the cross. The word redeemed was used of buying a slave in order to set him free. So the idea of redemption is applied here. Like I said, redeemed. We're to redeem or to buy up all the time that we have and devoted to the Lord. We are to buy the time, buy it up for ourselves, but we are to use it for serving the Lord. And Paul exhorts us to make the most of our time right after he exhorts us to walk wisely rather than foolishly. Other than purposely or disobeying God's word, the most spiritually foolish thing a Christian can do is to waste time and opportunity. To waste away his life in the little things that weren't really important and in half-hearted service to the Lord. When we walk obediently in the way of the Lord, we walk carefully, making the most of our time. And we take full advantage of every chance that we get to serve God, redeeming our time using it for his glory. Paul said, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. Galatians 6.10. In verse 17, where he says, don't be unwise, he reemphasizes what he said earlier about believers, not to be unwise. But understand, he says, what the will of the Lord is. This emphasizes more clearly his request for us to walk wisely. There's an urgency to make the most of our time. The unwise believer who behaves in a foolish way tries to work apart from God's will. That's why they're weak. When you try to work, try to do apart from God's will, you're weak, you're frustrated, you're ineffective in your personal life and in any work for God. And the only way to stop this foolishness is to find out what God's will is for you and to follow it. And God's basic will is found in the Bible. And there we find his perfect and sufficient guidelines for knowing and doing what pleases him. But the will that Paul seems to be talking about here is the Lord's specific leading of individual believers. Even though God's plan and directions for each believer aren't found in Scripture, the general principles for understanding them are there. God doesn't promise to show us His will through visions and coincidences and miracles, but He does. Uh, but He doesn't leave us guessing either. He didn't leave us here blind to grope around and try to figure things out. He left us the Word of God. He left us this. The Bible Instructions for life. What God wants us to know more than anything else for all of his children is that they know and obey his will and he gives us every uh, possible help to know and to obey it. In closing, God's primary will for every person is that he be saved through Christ and brought into his kingdom. And God's will is also that we be spirit-filled 
as Paul goes on to teach in the rest of this chapter. We, we experience God's will by being sanctified. The word sanctified means set apart. He saved us to set us apart for him. So we experience God's will by being set apart. Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. This is the will of God, your sanctification. See, it tells you this is God's will for you. Your sanctification. I want to I wanna set you apart for me. And then we enjoy his will as we submit to him and to others. Submission is believing that God is, a, is able to accomplish his will in my life. And I'll never know that until I submit to him and say, okay, God, take over my life. Submission is believing that God is able to accomplish his will in my life and through, even through the people that he's placed in authority over me. In the ABCs of Wisdom, the author said this about submission. That's a crucial definition because it focuses the attention on God and not on the person over you. And in Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. He said, let them do so with joy and not grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Father, we come before you this morning to thank you for this, <coughs> this amazing chapter, God. Lord, it's Paul's word to the unbeliever, um, to the believer, God, that we're to walk worthy, we're to walk in the light, God. And Lord, also for those that don't know you, Father, for those that maybe here aren't born again or those that, have, uh, that might be watching on TV or however, what method they're watching this live stream, if God's Spirit has spoken to you and you're tired of the old life and you're, 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 God's been speaking to you about the new life in Christ and you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, you want to become a child of God. You want to become one that's a, a, a redeemed man or woman. You want to be saved. You want to be born again. You want to know that, God forbid, the moment I died, God forbid it was even today, I, I know that I'd be going to heaven. That you would have this assurance. I'm going to pray this prayer out loud. It's a prayer of faith. Is to receive Christ. You repeat it to the Lord with all of your heart. Repeat after me, dear Jesus. Please forgive me, Lord, for all of my sins. I confess to you, I am a sinner. I want to receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your Spirit, Holy Spirit. Help me now to walk wisely, to walk in the light, to follow after you all the days of my life. And thank you, Lord, for now saving me, for dying on the cross for my sins. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you said that prayer, the Bible says that your name has then been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You've become a child of God. Begin to read the scriptures. Find you a Bible teaching church and begin to grow in Jesus Christ. Let me pray for the offering before we, we uh, conclude here and then uh, we'll go ahead and go. Father, thank you this morning again for this time and Father, we pray that uh, you would bless the offering this morning, God. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. We thank you for those that are your children and for their faithfulness, their obedience to you, Lord. We give you glory. We give you honor, Father. We thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight, Psalm 138, and it's about God's goodness to the faithful. God bless you guys. Amen. Could you please stand with us? Still wants to restore righteousness.
says to me. Go I walk through the valley, I will fear no evil thing. For you are with me, and you comfort me. Surely goodness, love, and mercy will follow wherever I God bless you guys.